second installment of our Artist Studio series. And tonight we are very honored to introduce an important and wonderful artist who has been featured in not one but two Whitney Biennials. Uh, was one of the first artists to show at MoMA PS1. Uh, has been featured and included in the museums, uh, major museums all, all over the country, all over the world. Uh, our forum, our America, so many millions of other things. The pride of Hunter College, Judy Rifka. <laughs> And then I decided 
decided, gee, I can't really be a, a, the painter I would really want to be unless I've gone to Europe. Uh, I, I, I mean, I really have been going to all the museums in New York City and galleries and so forth, but I really wanted to go to Europe and kind of play out my uh, art history education. So I did, I went. It was the late 60s. We beca became a hippie, we were all hippies, but I became, and I uh, hitchhiked all over Europe by myself and went to most of the major museums throughout Europe, drew from some works there, and, uh, and ended up coming back to London after going to all these various different countries. And did stay in London for a while and hit the uh, big music scene there, landed right in the middle of it. You came first with Donovan at that point. Oh, yes, Donovan and uh, Bear, yes, I became friends with Donovan. And uh, actually, when he came back to the States, I, and I, I came back before uh, he I stayed with them. I stayed with Donovan and Gypsy for uh, about, about a month. They invited me up to stay with them and met all these various musicians who were real big at that time. But that you know I'm really not that social of a person, but I always seem to end up kind of in the middle of whatever is going on. I don't know how that happens, but uh, that sort of did. But Anyway, I'm from there. I went. I decided I would go to the studio school, this wonderful school that had just begun, right? And it was a breakaway school from Pratt, so that could satisfy my rebellious nature or my wild hippie nature. And uh, these students had decided that they wanted to really immerse themselves in painting, having models, or painting, or studying. Uh, art seriously, uh, the, the teachers were all bona fide abstract expressionists, right? And many of them had studied with Hans Hoffmann. Here we go. And I, you know, I put this, I've uh, assembled these two little pictures. We all recognize uh, uh, Hoffman here. And uh, Mr. Push and Pull, right? A very dynamic uh, 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 artist. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of push and pull on Hoffman. Okay, we have plenty of comers. And, and uh, who was talk, who would talk about working from nature, right? Working from nature, but at the same time understanding the space and the dynamics of push and pull. Really, he was talking about it in terms of uh, color interaction, but he did talk about understanding the space a lot. And to me. The, that push and pull was really more about the spatial connection. So even though I never really met Hans Hoffman, I, uh, he really probably influenced me a great deal by uh, the people at Studio School. Here's a quickie. <laughs> I don't know why I'm not going to describe him finally. I'm just going to show uh, how we got from, how we got to here. There are, there are a number of paintings of mine over the years. And I'm going to show somewhat of how we got from one to the other. You know, I'm somebody who, it's very hard for me to read a book without running to the end or see a movie like on YouTube without running to the end and finding out what happens. So I'll show you a little bit what happened and then we're going to get back to these. There are some collages, paintings on wood, um, earlier paintings, linen on linen. Um, okay, let's jump over. And more, some early 80s, some linen on linen collages, kind of um, lexicon of, of, of letters. Okay, so let's find out. Oh, okay. So here, I, you know, this is just a little grouping. Did I do that? I guess I did that, sure. <laughs> oh, okay. Of um, works that are in the that's the best frame you get? Yeah, I guess so. Nice. First, we can keep going. Oh, keep there's, going. There's this image and this image. Okay, place. go back one. Go there. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, all right. So, some things that the Vogels collected. Anybody uh, here hear about the Vogels collection? Yeah. Herb and Dorothy Vogel were, were New Yorkers that were just kind of regular everyday people. He was a mailman? He yeah. was a post, postal yes. worker, yes. And they featured in the time. Yeah. yeah, so. Judy was featuring her collection prominently. They, they were really 
really very wonderful people. You know, they had started out, the Vogels had started out as painters themselves, in friends with only abstract expressionists. And they were very serious, very unusual looking, I mean, not that it really affects their thinking, but they happen to have been very tiny people, but it just sort of adds to the flavor of the story. And uh, they, uh, she was a librarian also. And, and thank goodness for that too, because she was very organized in uh, her thinking of how she's going to assemble their collection and what she's going to do. She took all the right steps. And uh, uh, actually, Ron Gorshaw, the painter who I was very good, really good friends with, um, introduced me to the Vogels. And I think I was at a show at the Point Tower at that time, and they came running over to my studio to see what was going on. I continued to come to my studio for many years to that her. And uh, Ron explained to me that you can sell work to the Vogels for a very inexpensive price, usually $100. Like a lot of money to me, but <laughs> hey, you know. Uh, and uh, because eventually they'll probably make sure to get it into a collection and that they're very you know, committed collectors. So I went along with it and, and they would come over. He, over the years, chose a number of these. He also chose a lot of little studies of mine that I did for uh, my uh, side artist thing of uh, uh, doing mural commissions. And I tend to take it seriously. <laughs> anyway. They assembled their collection mostly um, post-minimal. <coughs> that is the period following minimal which I have some little writing about um, what post mill is, which I don't totally agree with. But anyway, it's a carrying on from the minimal into some um, other thinking about what can be done, given that uh, you've reduced painting to a really its minimal components. And can we go back one little step? Sure. OK, yeah, this, I know. I, this, I didn't even go, does this have at the bottom one? Is this was, these were at Delaware Museum. They, they did contribute all of their work, and they really worked very hard and very beautifully on this, to 50 museums around the country, including, definitely Hawaii, I guess one per state. Uh, and each museum, would receive a painting. But they negotiated that, yes, they would receive a painting, but it had to be on display always, and it would not be sold. So I think as an artist, I can relax quite a lot now. That's the big thing people worry about. That, you know, things are all going to get tossed. But I know How that. How am I supposed to auction your paintings? Yeah, <laughs> yeah but they are at least are in, you know, in museum collections. So I, you know, I'm breathing easy. I say, well, I don't care what happens now. I'm already in all those museum collections. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, they did have some shows. You know, I was invited to this show. I, I don't remember what I was doing at the moment. But I I, I got an email about it. I just thought, oh, the vocals are going to put them in another show. I don't know where go. I'll probably put my work in the back next to the bathrooms or something. But <laughs> I, I didn't go to the other. But I did end up going down to, uh, the, this was a Delaware Museum, and at Philadelphia uh, Academy, and at Delaware, I went to the same, the same day, so a very nice person took me to both. And mine was featured right in, and they built a wall and put mine in, right in the middle of the whole show. But of course they quoted uh, Richard Tuttle or something, so I don't think it was Tuttle, but that's okay. And so they put mine right in the center to explain what post-minimal and so it really had this wonderful place and really nice frame. It's a cardboard. It's on cardboard. Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit about how I arrived at these works. It is not as it seems to be one flat big shape. It is actually built up. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that as we go on. So I don't want to control my whole action. Oh, looking at art. Uh, okay. Oh, where is this thing? Okay, I just grabbed something from Je Jeremy Gillerall, who did a review in Art Forum, young artist that I was at. I 
would uh, put paintings in the Biker Gallery, and Klaus Curtis was a wonderful dealer of the, the Biker Gallery. And, you know, later on, I think Mary Glenn actually sort of in, stepped into it and inherited and went on from the Biker Gallery. I don't know exactly how that worked out, but remember she came in there and she seemed to take over at some point, and then I don't know how the what permutation or how that changed Mary Glenn as they went on. She was a kid. She was young. <laughs> And anyway, no, I remember we were riding around the back of cars and so forth. And we were just late, early Tribeca. I call old Tribeca, which is really hard for me to imagine calling that old Tribeca. Because everybody was all so young and green. But um, so I showed it the biker gallery. As fate would have it, that that very same building, I, I showed with the Alexanders for years, years later. As fate would happen, I ended up showing in that same building with the Alexanders many years later. And we always used to run up into the, there was no bathroom at the Biker Gallery on the second floor or whatever that was. We would run to the, these nice people, the Alexanders, which was used in the bathroom. So that was how I first met them. But anyway, so he talked, he really understood, or at least he let me explain myself. Now, isn't that wonderful when you can ex when uh, when an art writer will actually ask you what the what the Sam Hill you're doing, <laughs> rather than trying to put it together and assemble some strange philosophy? But he did. He asked what I was doing, and I explained it to him uh, about how I my thinking about building up those shapes. Let let us go on a little bit. It was really a wonderful review. Hey. If you, if you really want to get into this, there's a really nice uh, website, which I, I put together with the help of my director, son Matthew. And um, we really worked hard on it. And he's so pushy, he really made me get everything right. All. But there's a section with, that has the texts. And uh, if you go into jubertho.com, I think. And there's a section with the text, and it really has very nicely laid out quite, not all, but a number of the more important articles on my work. And so we'll explain that, especially the one by Jeremy. That is, was a great review in um, Art Forum. It's this, that um, space in a painting, you know, of course, you know, I'm an abstractionist, but space in a painting is built up by deciding that you're putting down one mark and then you decide where you're going to put down the next mark, and what is the connection between them. Now, you can make any way of connecting them, but it's always some kind of emotional connection. How are, how are the essential uh, parts of a composition connected? Um, and of course, you know that could be anywhere from perspective to emotional, to uh, some kind of compositional idea. But I'm thinking that that is always the space in, a, in a, an opinion. And I'm thinking of also of something like, a, this could be a jump, but thinking of something like a, an amoeba. An amoeba is deciding where it's going to go next. It decides where it's going to go next, and then it goes there. It goes there with this little pseudopod, and it makes its body there. Uh, and you know, at the time, I was sort of, I was very interested in dance, also. So I'm thinking, also, you know, you you're here, you want to go there, then you go there, and this becomes the, this essence. It, it becomes a body. So your decision to, from going one place to another can be connected by the paint rather than making uh, space actually connecting them. And I continue to go back and forth over each other. Oh, let's hit that. That was nice. This is even more recent, but I, I did to show how, this really physically shows how the uh, painted forms really connect and intertwine. That's not tape, by the way, that's a little thing. So that they, there's a physicality um, to the space and 
the, the space becomes a form and the shape is created by movement from one thing to another in these paintings. From you know, something from an article I read uh, of yours, um, there, you, you mentioned a professor that you had that um, talked about when you stopped, when you stopped making the piece of work, why you stopped there, what that decision was. So you're talking about this, this motion and movement and the amoeba crime, but yeah. also the point where it ends, the painting is done, and what decision had to happen for that to take place, which I never really, it hurts me putting it in words, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> but a, as to why I stopped, um, I, I do, I noticed that I, uh, there is a little voice. Uh, my friend told me, by the way, never tell anybody that I actually hear little voices in my head because that's not going to lie. But I actually do. Uh, it, you know, when it comes time that something is finished, I, you know, just very quietly am saying, oh, I kind of like that. And <laughs> that's it. That, that is the end. But it does seem to close itself off in some way, and then I have no further desire to work on it. However, I really think that anything could happen at any time. I mean, just because I decided to work on it, you know, that was my decision. It doesn't really mean that it would have had to. It did. Something that I really learned from um, getting involved in video. I, I would make, um, I would make uh, some kind of a graphic and keep it moving along and move with it and change it and Till I decided, uh, you know, a, a, a form, a more sculptural form. Till I decided this, this is how it has to be. Oh, this is how it has to be, and or make a decision from one to another. And then I'm realizing it, it really could be anything. And uh, so uh, that's, you know, when I started making the videos, it just could include everything. 